came up or something like that. So it was, it was always very unpredictable. We had never, people want to advertise and I said, no, no, we don't advertise anywhere. And I, I've said, I'm not into it so much, but many people, many, you know, probably 20 papers have been written off this site here. So, but this is the topic of what we're talking about here. It's tracking face blindness. And we use that website and another website as well, using citizen science. But, you know, when I said I would do this, I think it was either Charlie or Judy, um, uh, uh, encouraged me to do this because I think they read a, a, a book, a, an article by Oliver Sacks. And I'd forgotten that. I don't, really, I, I, I don't fully believe in face blindness, but I'll, I'll show you. There is such a, there, 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 people do have definite deficits, but it's the wrong word. You, we'll get to that. So I, I go like this, I cross that out. Because the people who are face blind have Remarkable face processing. You'll see this, and and, and, and we'll talk to um, S Suzanne because I think she might uh, bring this up. We'll get some. We'll get some more insight from her. Okay, two guests. That that's Suzanne and my sister-in-law Alice. Okay, our, our face is special. This is a big debate in the whole psychology and neuroscience literature, and uh, most people seem to think they're special. Um, um, oh yeah, this is an interesting point. And I, before I was even interested in psychology, I used to record neurophysiology and the retina, but my daughter was born in 1967. It was very strange because she was born at home. I, my first wife was really, she was way ahead of her time. This was, 19, it was before we had midwives. So somehow my daughter was born at home. And so like, I was just talk, picking her up like one hour after I was born and walking around the house with her. And I was trying to get her attention. And I just couldn't get her, I mean, her eyes were completely open. She wasn't sleeping and I just couldn't get her attention. And, and then I started moving my hands around, waving or nothing happened. Then I moved my head back and forth. And, and it's funny, you know how babies are, their eyes just lock on something, whoop, 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 like that. So I didn't mm. think about it too much, but it was very remarkable. But then a number of years later, everybody is doing this. Here's kind of an experiment where some different people, pediatricians, there's many studies, they, they will, they had to be scientific, so they couldn't wob wobble their heads because they had to put different kinds of things up there. And, and, and lo and behold, um, uh, babies, newborns within hours of birth, just like my daughter, would follow something like this, not this, not this. It was pretty amazing. So faces are, at least, they're pretty damn special to babies. And of course, we know that that's part of your social development. And one, one, one thing people have to do is if kids don't relate to their mom and they're eating them and stuff like that, who knows? There's something called mutual eye gaze that each one looks into the other's eyes and stuff like that. And a baby, I think some mothers will remember that when your baby is nursing or reading a book, babies don't like that. They want their, they want to be looking to the eyes of the mother. <laughs> you can't uh, ch check out like that. So anyway, um, and then we kind of project, we're, faces are so important, we just project them onto the world. We, you know, look at, just look somewhere and all of a sudden we see faces. Here's a bunch of things. Now, most of you have seen something like that. All of a sudden you say, oh, there's a face there. And um, here's another funny one here. <laughs> <laughs> and even one here. <laughs> so, 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 and, and it, so we, it, and, and we rarely project other things on the world. Faces seem to have some kind of special primacy. So, and there's something special about faces, and I'm going to give you three different things, uh, sort of psychological things here. First of all, um, when you turn a face upside down, they're really harder to recognize than when you turn other things up. This is sort of statistical, but I'll show you that. And there's something about faces that that when you um, when you see a face, when, when you study faces, there's something more. It's not just the parts. It's somehow the whole thing, the whole thing, people use the word gestalt, whatever you want to use, a configural or holistic. And when you see a face, it's not just, it's, 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 and related to that, I call it ineffable. I like that word for some reason. I've been, I don't use it all the time. I mean, if you recognize a face, you can't use, sometimes you can, I'll show you examples. You can't use language. It's somehow kind of ineffable. You can't describe it. So here's a bunch of Ashby Village people. I don't know. I'm not very good at faces. I'm kind of pros, but can you people can you recognize these people? Um, yeah. Uh, Andy. Andy. Okay. Andy. And and Groves. Uh, no. 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 Mark. Is Hillary. It Mark. Yeah, Mark. Mark. I know Mark. Shirley. So here they are. Okay. <laughs> oh, I got Shirley. Oh, I thought that was Shirley. Yeah. Wow, what a difference. So. Yeah. 
So, you know, it's not, in some sense, well, just to jump ahead, I think for, for the ability of prosopagnosia to recognize faces is a little bit like, I'm not saying it's they don't have that experience, but their quality of their ability to recognize faces might be like upside down faces. That's not too far off. They're, they're not great at it, but they can do it sometimes. That's Andy several years ago. Yeah, he's that's <laughs> the, young, the young Andy. That's all right. I, I just got this off the website. The young Andy. Yeah. And there's some other. I, I, I'm a I'm a demo maker. You'll see that. I like to make demos. I'm, I'm, you'll see that. I'm, I'm, uh, um, my my training is a very hard science, but somehow I got the bug. I'll explain that why. I got the bug that to I, to really convince people of things, you, you shouldn't do complicated experiments with brain measurements. You just make demos. So here's a demo I made. So here's some faces. Here's four faces. Can you see the four faces here? They're upside down. They're really hard um, to see. One, two, three. I can now that you said they're upside you got, down. You, you gotta work you gotta work at it, right? But yeah. look here. That's better. Uh-huh. There's a real big difference of upside down and right side up. Yeah. So here's another okay. And configure all this very important. This is a in other words, somehow you can't, you, 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 in many ways, when you see a face, you, you can't say you, it, it's, it's the whole face, it's the whole face, it's not just parts of the face. So, you, you recognize anybody here? Pieces of people. And you, do know, you know who this person is? No. You, you may be put together those four people. Well, so you're getting close, there's two people. So, well, anybody you know? Woody mm -hmm. Allen. How's that? Oh, oh. It's Woody Allen. Oh. So when you take when you, when you take when you take the other part away, all of a sudden Woody Allen appears much it's much clearer, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you when you put the when you put the bottom and the top of the face, it becomes almost a new face. I mean you can now sort of see it, but Woody Allen is much more obvious on the right than on the left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. You just can't isolate the parts. You can't isolate, and most other most other you can you can isolate. And here's another example. This is the young Margaret Thatcher and the young Hillary Clinton. And then you can do you know Mad Libs, you know that kind of stuff I just did there. And there they are. And there's the composites from the top of Hillary and the bottom of blah blah blah. blah. Uh -huh. They're new people. You, really don't, you, you get new people. Different people. And this is another. Um, Margaret Thatcher and demonstrations, and maybe you've seen these in museums, it's kind of fun. So what's happening here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the Mad Libs, right? Because you're, you, 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 this is the kind of thing you should do with your grandchildren. You do stuff like that. You can take your photos. And what you've done is, what's happened here is you've, you've just taken these eyes here and clipped them out and then put them in reverse and then clipped them out, put them in reverse. Okay, it looks pretty awful, but that's upside down. Right side up. Look at that. <laughs> so, so the upside, so that you really see all kinds of imperfections. You don't see the, I mean, it's all messed up here, but you don't kind of notice it. So your ability to process faces is really way better right side up than upside down. That's really good. And, and a lot of objects, I just threw some objects here. I mean, basically a lot of objects, it's no big deal upside down and right side up doesn't make any difference and um the ineffable part this is the part i really like it's not so when you do recognize things like i've got a goldfinch in the backyard well they've got a yellow body and a, you know a black thing here and red tail or a spider it's got eight legs got a big sort of belly here this kind of beetle here or suitcase it's got a sort of a, kind of a you know kind of a rectangle here a little handle here and cup there has got a handle like that and even some faces I mean we know that's Charlie Chaplin even if you're not good at face recognition you can't help but recognizing him and who's that guy Harvey 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 he's got that little thing that he's bald and he's got that portmanteau Harvey thing here so that's easy so what about these guys who's that Clinton who's Clinton. that oh, I don't but, say his name <laughs> okay but how do you know he's Trump I mean there's no there's no identity on good suppose you're going to tell somebody who that was. I mean, it's not you all here. I mean, yeah, sometimes you can tell, but some, th th these are pretty nondescript. I don't, I wouldn't know. Maybe some of you can do that. Somebody, somebody here looks evil. <laughs> <laughs> looks, does. Yeah, okay. Now, here's my chairman. When I was at Harvard, this guy, he, he would change mustaches and beards and stuff like that. And so one time, 
I don't know what he did. I think he shaved off his mustache or came here. And I said to him, so, did you get new glasses or something? Did, do you ever, has anybody had an experience when somebody changes their face and you, and you think something else happened, but it wasn't really what it was, it's something different. But that means that what my representation of his face is nothing to do with the glasses or the beard. It's something kind of more mysterious. I said, okay, that's why I call him Nephilim. Anybody had this experience? I've had it very rarely. I have had that experience several times. My, my roommate got her hair cut way short. I didn't notice it at all for two days until she told me. And, um, and, and I have another friend too that um, he'd had a mustache for many, many years and he finally cut it off. I couldn't, I, and of course, can you see something different? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so it's sort of strange. It's sort of, uh, so would we- you No, know, Ken, can I make a point? Sure, sure. I, yeah, I just, I, I've noticed that a lot and I, um, I've always ascribed it to the idea that when you know somebody well, you interact with that person as a person. For example, I have a friend who has, I think it's called strabismus where the eyes go in different directions. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, at first, when I first met him, it was quite obvious and I you know, noticed it. And if anybody asked me, I'd say, oh, he's the guy with the funny eyes or something like that. But after I got to know him for a while, you don't even pay attention to it anymore. Right, right. So you, don't think, pay, you, you, you don't pay attention to these little, I call them little features, if that's the word, but I don't know if that's the right word. Yeah. You're kind of interacting with the whole person and much more so than, or maybe it's the whole image of the face. I don't know, but it's, but it's not the, 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 the details. Right. Well, it's similar too when our friends um, start growing older and we don't think necessarily that they look any different, but if you then see a picture of them when they were 20 years younger, think, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> not us. Not us. <laughs> but it's like the frog in the water. It happens so gradually that you don't, uh, uh, you know. You don't know. Those, are good, you. those are good examples, yeah. I mean, my, my mother used to tell us during World War II, she was working for the army in Hawaii and when handling classified information as a secretary. And one day she went into her boss's office, dropped some papers on his desk and walked out again. And it was a delayed reaction of a couple of minutes before he exploded. Who was it? She had changed her hair color over the weekend. Oh. <laughs> but it had taken him that long to do it to notice that there was a difference. <laughs> and I've noticed if, if particularly with women, if you change hairstyles, I will, if I'm lucky, know that it's different, but it erases my memory of what was there. If you haul me before a grand jury and say, what did she look like last week? You know, I'm stuck. Well, you can't, you can't update your well, if you've known a person all your life, you can't access how they, the, what they looked a long time ago, unless you haven't seen them for 30 years, something like that. Okay, we'll move on here. So is this science, all these demo science? Well, I th to me, this is the heart of science to me. This is what I, I, I became, um, I, I had a sort of hard node, three of my, as I said, three of my, my postdocs are physicists, but I, I, this demo mode is something that I really um, and embraced quite early in my life, and I, and it's really due to Frank Oppenheimer. You know, anybody know this guy, Frank Oppenheimer? Yeah. Sure. So I was so, super impressed. I, I really didn't like Frank. Frank was a kind of unpleasant guy, but I spent quite a bit of time with him. He's one of these people that he was a chain smoker. He was Jay Roberts' brother. Most of you know that, and he's eight years younger. He's a communist, but he set up this wonderful museum, and you all know about this museum. And then he, his idea of having a conversation with you was have three or four of you converse with him because he was so impatient with people as far as I was concerned. So you, we all had to take turns as a time sharing with Frank. But he had some really interesting ideas. He basically thought that modern science was just too arcane and it was it, it's too, uh, too the realm of experts. You need to have some kind of way of demonstrating to the to the to just lay people what the essence of science is. And that really influenced me all my whole career. And I've always, it's been a lodestone for me. And I've, I've known you know, to practice it, but it's something that is important to me. And so, but now we're gonna go into the, some science here. Not, not the, uh, Frank, would, Frank sort of changed over the years. So is there some evidence that their faces are special? And there's three different things, brain damage accounts, and I won't talk about that too late, but because we're going to talk about a different kind of brain, uh, quote, brain damage, brain scanning, and 
maybe some other <laughs> measurements. I think do I anyway. Um, people have talked about um, face recognition problems for many, many years. Um, I went to visit Oliver Sacks in his apartment. I don't think it, was, it wasn't his apartment. He must have two apartments because when I walked to his apartment, it was right above Greenwich Village. It just had, there was no tables and chairs and kitchens. It was just books, like for many rooms. And so I guess he, he, he as, a, as a celebrated author, he used to have another apartment. And he, he we, we were talking, he says, well, he, went, he, he had two or three women assistants, like librarians, <laughs> it was so funny. And he, he, he summoned one and, and uh, he got some book from 1844, some neurologist, some doctor, and he brought this book down and they were recounting problems with face recognition. So it's been around, probably around even longer than that. But this guy, Joachim Bodemer, sort of credited with really doing a large number of studies. I think mostly it, it was after, right after 1947. So these are people who were in the war. And I think a lot of them died. I mean, they had brain lesions, had brain, it, it was shot up and stuff like that. Some of the people didn't even survive. But he found that there were some very specific deficits in the temporal lobe having to do with um, having to do with face recognition. So he's, 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 his paper has been even translated into English. So that's, so there's that, that brings up the idea that this acquired and developmental prosopagnosia. Acquired is what Bodemer studied, but there's something called developmental prosopagnosia, which it's, I don't, that's a very funny word because I don't know what it means, but it means that you can't find, you can't find anything wrong with them. It sort of just ha happened that way, but it'll become more obvious. Probably there's a genetic component here. So, but there's no known, known cause. Usually they should call it, what's the word for unknown in Latin? Anyway, whatever it is. Um, so, uh, and so brain scanning, one of my friends here, her name is Nancy Kandor, she's a very famous professor at MIT. And um, actually when she was sort of right, right in my lab, I hired her and then she got away, she went to MIT. But anyway, she found these face patches when you, you, have, you have people looking at a computer screen and put them in a scanner and then she really, this is, this is back like 30 years ago, almost 1997, I guess 27 years ago. Anyway, this catapulted her to a very famous person. And so they found these three patches in the posterior part of the brain and they've just re responded very selectively, you presented faces and present other things they didn't light up. So that was pretty amazing. And it sort of confirmed all the neurological findings and the clinical findings. And then uh, Doris Tao, who's, a, I knew her when she was a graduate student at Harvard, but she, she really did a lot of things in the, in the monkey. She recorded brain cells in the monkey, looking at all kinds of faces and things like that. And she found very similar little face patches. In fact, her work is much more detailed because in monkeys, they, could, they have like seven, seven face patches on each side. And if you put, if you record neurons in that face patch, you can see that, let's say you go into that face patch and record from cells, each one of these bars is the response of one particular cell. Every darn cell in that area responds to faces. And, and then that area, and you, if you stimulate, uh, show hands to the monkey or bodies or fruits or gadgets or something, mm -hmm. nothing else. This area is just like packed full of nerve cells that mm -hmm. respond to faces. So there is, that sounds like a specialized face system to me. Interesting. So, so then I'm gonna go now and talk about um, um, you know, people who might have these difficulties. And it's kind of funny this, I, I, I was, you know, it's funny um, when you're a professor, I was at a tiny little institute and you know, I didn't really care what, whether what I was doing would be of interest to the general public. I was just guided by my own interest in things and stuff like that. But when you go to a university like Harvard and you have to teach, it's kind of, it's kind of unpleasant for me. I, I, I didn't get to Harvard until I was age 50 and I really hadn't taught ever. And um, I was just, and I, I, was, uh, I had to find things that Harvard students are kind of, they're kind of demanding. They want to be entertained. And they kind of want to learn something too. So that's kind of too demanding as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, um, so I, I really didn't, re so I'd show movies of people that prosopagnosis, but I didn't really believe it. So I, but gradually, and then there's this developmental prosopagnosis as well. I said, really, is that true? And so this one guy um, at Santa Barbara, he's, he became my student as a postdoctoral student. And he, he for his PhD dissertation, he studied a guy named Bill. I just noticed that Bill died. 2016 but I got to he, so he did a whole thesis studying one guy and it was either was I was pretty convinced that Bill 
because he showed Bill all kinds of things to recognize and and Bill did terrible at faces and all other things he, he did pretty well so I mean I, I don't think it was perfect but but in many sense I think Bill was was the it can, I'm the kind of person that needs to be convinced I need to see something and and so I had to go meet Bill. <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm, one of these, I'm one of these skeptical people. I don't believe people when they say they've done something. So I met Bill. I can't test him a little bit. And he was in, he's a, in the middle of Castro Street. So I, there were no women around in his world. It was all, all men. That was an unusual situation. I, I hadn't been in that world. But anyway, Bill, he, that convinced me. Then somehow Brad ended up in my lab. And he's a, he's a terrific guy. And he's a, he's a well-known professor at Dartmouth right now. So what Brad and I did, but you know, there are people who can't really recognize face. How are you going to find them? So I said, let's let's put up a bird feeding station. <laughs> let's put up a a web page and just put it out there. That's it. We'll just put it up there. Maybe people will flock to it. And we did. I got a fre I got a freshman um, at Harvard, and he he did everything. And and then that web page was the old old one. And if you some of you, if you go you go to facepoint.org. And you'll get this web page. I have nothing to do with it now. It's Dartmouth. What's it? Yeah, it's still Harvard. I mean, anyway, that's it. That's just the history and stuff like that. But there's another guy at Harvard, at Harvard Medical School, that uses this website. So we, we got thousands of people signed up. So just and then and people are using that website all the time now. We have it all arranged by. So if you live in San Francisco, you can find people who are in San Francisco who have that. So the internet really allows people to do research you're never able to do before. And we, we were the first people. It's kind of odd because it maybe doesn't mean much to you, but um, the kind of research I used to do, I used to just study two, one or two subjects. And the subject I used to study was myself a lot, very careful measurements. But this is the opposite. Okay, so these people come to the website and we start you know, asking them questions and stuff. I'll have a few testimonies and maybe Susan, Susan Flowers can talk a little bit more about it, but this is just a couple here. And um, what what what, the, what happens to them? This is a woman, she's Canadian. I remember that. And actually, her whole, her a lot of people in her family had problems as well. But this is this is something that they, everybody has a signature story that can tell. Uh, this week, I went to the wrong baby at my son's daycare and only realized that he was my my son when the entire daycare staff <laughs> looked at me in horrified <laughs> disbelief. Wow. <laughs> And this one is a similar. Last month, I placed my nine-year-old son at the Cub Scout pack meeting. True horror and panic. Remove a hundred, hundred boys dressed alike, all with ge generic little boy haircuts. Blah blah blah. <laughs> I sent, <laughs> I sent my daughter out in bloodhound mode. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of funny. Um, this guy Bill. This is where he had a nervous breakdown. This guy here. He had a, We went into the Navy. Oh my God. And everybody's got those short haircuts and sailor crap. He just, he completely lost it. He just had a nervous breakdown. He just, uh -huh. he did. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, it's, it's just terrible. He had a very hard life there. This woman I really got to know quite well. Many a friendship was lost or damaged. She's a PhD in mathematics and differential job. I know the field of mathematics is kind of very advanced. It was bewildering to me to have a person quit speaking to me while saying I'd been extremely rude. And personally, I have no idea what I'd done. Uh, if we kept in touch, I'd help to explain. But of course, many have long quit speaking to me. I think Susan, oh, no. Susan's going to talk about that. I hope she's going to talk about how you how you navigate your life if you don't recognize phases. It's, it's quite challenging. And this woman, most this is something I was really surprised at. Most prosopagnosis. I thought there would be a lot of Aspergers. Mm. She she was clearly Asperger. She was a very nice woman. She was clearly Asperger's, I think, I'm pretty sure, uh, just the way she related. But she was, I, I liked her a lot. But very rarely did I find people like that. So maybe, I think people that come to our website might be, you know, sample or something like that. It may not be the normal pop, you know, the overall population. And this is something that happens a lot, but not as much as I thought. I think prosopagnosia has worsened my current depression, if not the root cause of it. I prefer to be reckless because I can't confidently function any other way. Just imagine, you go to a party, all these people around me, you just can't strike up a conversation with them. I mean, you, you know, it's pretty, that's pretty limiting. Actually, Oliver Sacks is like that. I, I, I didn't know he's prosopagnosic, but I was talking about prosopagnosia to a reporter, and she said, 
She thought he was, this is before he came out. He's at a party, he was kind of lost. And I actually, I have a friend of mine who used to know Oliver Sacks when they were kids. And she'd go over to Oliver's house and he never knew what the hell she was. <laughs> and this is Bill again. But the point here, and I've dealt with this a lot. And you know, when you study a group of people, then you get to find out all kinds of things. And what about, what about going to school? You know, you're prosopagnosic, mm -hmm. can't recognize faces. And you're dealing with all kinds of, well, you go to a small school, that's okay. You know, get people with the same clothes and stuff like that. But it's really kind of hard. And um, I, it's kind of funny. I was in Boston for um, studying this stuff. I also get this phone call from these very high achievement lawyers. I think they're in Greenwich, Connecticut. And um, they're, because the daughter says, the daughter claims that she can't recognize faces and she doesn't want to go to this really fancy school. It's just too stressful. She was, I think, just entering high school. And, um, and so she wanted to be tested. So, cause their parents didn't believe her. They didn't believe, what, what can't recognize faces, what's that? They couldn't, they couldn't believe that. So they drove all, all the way up to connect to Boston. We test her, thank God she did badly. Who knows if she really did bad, I don't know. We did other things like that. And, and they, they relented and they went to some, not such a you know, high profile, you know, top of the line school. And they wrote back a couple of years later, she's doing fine. So. And I've had a couple kids like that, and, but they can't, it's not a record. I mean, if you're, if you're autistic or something like that, or oh, right, autism is much better than mental retardation. Autism, you have to, the school do something for it, but they wouldn't do it for this one boy. So it's not, so the public, public inf I don't know what should be done, but public information needs to be done a lot more here. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. Um, this is some data here, I'm gonna give you some data. These scores mean that's, these are M1 to M6. These are each one of these dots is a test. I think it's done twice of people that at least uh, clinically, if you interview, they're, they're, they're terrible at faces, but really they don't really seem to, I mean, there's some, this is, this is one standiation down, but you know, some people almost normal. And the test, this is the standard test of the day. You're given a picture here and all you're supposed to do is have six pictures and just match it up. Well. You know, you just, and you have unlimited time. You I mean, you eventually, without even being able to recognize faces, you just sort of match stuff up. And so, you know, why, that, so that, no wonder prosopagnos can pass the face test, but you know, this is not a really good test. So we, I, I think this is when we made this test, you know, make testing. So I told Brad, we got to make a test. It took us a couple of years to make this test. I don't know why it took so long, but I, what I did was I, um, I took a hundred, took a hundred people, hundred Harvard students, and I, and I took a hundred pictures of each Harvard student under different lighting and all kinds of stuff like that. Anyway, and um, and this is the original test. And what you were, uh, you're given six faces, and here's some six faces in all at once, and then, you, and then and then you have another part of the test where you have to pick out one of the which one is, and this is an identical thing, that's fine. Then later on, you're shown a bunch of faces, hey, which, which is the matching one here, and that's the matching one here. And this is a little harder. And here's, I think you got, did any of you take the test on, on, on the web? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Nobody did? I did. I did. I'm waving my this, hand. Okay, good. I did. Yeah. And, you, and you saw these funny faces here. This is, mm -hmm. and they, mm -hmm. they can't, the trouble in the studying face recognition, you can't, you, you, you can, after, you, after the person has done the test, they're sort of ruined. They've seen these faces again, so you have to make another test, which takes a lot of, a lot of trouble. Anyway, same idea. You see those three faces there, and then which is the matching one? I guess that one is the matching one. And that one's the matching one there. So anyway, those are 72 items. And um, because it's one out of three chances, 24 items you can get right on chance, so it's 33%. So here's a graph of different um, abilities. I, I converted to the scores. If you, if you, any of you remember your scores, um, you can see that one, one of the really surprising things is that um, as you go through adolescence here, you know, you really, you really, I mean, 15 year old is not really at peak. You get much better after age 15. Kid, kids are not very good at recognizing, learning new faces. It, mm. it turned out to be around 31 and a half years was the peak. Mm. Steady decline here. That's me. Um, I don't know where I am anywhere. I'm more than 70. I'm out here, but maybe we're down here. So if you did better than 54 or 53 or 52, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> is that, is that the, um, that's not the first one. That's not the, the 
famous people. No, this is not the famous people. You probably did badly at that because, because um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't even know those celebrities. This is a test. Yeah, I, mean, I, got, I got a 62 on this one. You're up here. You're above. You're better than the peak. You're higher than the peak of... Uh, you're at your, your peak. Five. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just saw the movie the the big year last night. So, how many birds did you get? <laughs> well, you can see that it's kind of, the the data gets more hazy on here because this, I think this is like twenty thousand people, and it, you know a lot of old people don't sign up for the business. A huge number of people are signing up in their thirties and stuff like that, and. What's kind of interesting, this is, this is part of science. You're not allowed to test anybody without their parents' consent before age 18. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. so, um, and so this is really kind of tricky. How can you, how can you get this data? How can we get this data down here? You know, who's making all that noise? Somebody's got to mute themselves. Somebody's got a noisy environment? OK, that's good. Anyway. Um, this is part of being a scientist. You have to deal with all these hurdles because basically, if I follow, if we follow the rules, we all those people to the left of that arrow we couldn't test. But it's pretty interesting. There's a lot of things happening here, and there's even there's some evidence that around age, age, age 12 and 13, boys have a little kind of arrested development, maybe puberty or something. Like girls don't show that but anyway. But it's, who knows if that's completely correct? But somebody showed that. But anyway. So Laura is one of these really smart people. She's street smart. She goes to the IRB and says, you know, people are going to come to this website and they're going to say, are you 18? And they're just going to lie. They're going to say, I'm 18. <laughs> so are you, do you want to condone or, you know, condone lying? Or you want to, you want to sort of be a, um, a kind of a, a sort of a, an accomplice for lying? <laughs> so they, melt, they melted. We let us do it. <laughs> It's pretty neat. So anyway, um, I've got a lot of age curves and a lot of different visual functions. We might talk about some other times, but um, it, it's what's interesting. Vocabulary. You must have. You, most of you know your your vocabulary is probably just as good as your grandchildren or better. Probably better. So vocabulary sort of runs. It just increases like that. Okay. So we, with our face test, we did a bunch of them. We, we were able to characterize the prosopagnosics a lot better. So uh, it's, you know, it's not perfect. But. You measured it? Nothing here about tomorrow. You can uh, mute him, Audrey. Apartment tomorrow morning. Audrey, why don't you mute morning. out because he's, he's, uh, uh, he's on the phone. I'll be able to see clearly for several hours. Where is he? Oh, so there he is. I wouldn't be able to Skype if he's from back. Got him. Okay, okay he's muted. <laughs> okay, so anyway, we, our face tests are better. I mean, they're not perfect and stuff like that. Um, so maybe face blinds are wrong. Well, I'll, I'll get into this in a minute because uh, the people, even though they can't really recognize people very well, and they have to, to, real trouble in real life. And actually, the, the face tests, a lot of the people that did these face tests, they said, you know, that's not really a good test because people are moving all the time. If, if the faces are stationary, I can sort of see it better, but they're moving all the time. I can't really do very well. So anyway, but. It turns out that um, face blind might be the wrong word here. That's that's sort of going to be the bottom line. I hate to tell you it's the wrong word. And uh, because pe pe um, people have a terrible time recognizing faces can do stuff really quite amazing. Here's something um, uh, I found was if you take all these faces and make a card sort and you get the order of the card, so you rank all of the card sort. And then what you do is you take the average ranking of all the faces of the mean of, let's say, 20 people and you correlate that with your with you in other words if you're very if you if you if you're kind of if your face attraction is a uh, with the the whole group you'll have a correlation coefficient maybe 0 0.6 7 8 or 9 or something like that and that's what i found in in harvard undergrads what lo and behold a uh, prosopagnosis is pretty good too i mean there i mean this one is correlation about point you know not 8 9 or something like that I mean, he's right on, these people are very, not that different than normal. Oh, there's one weirdo here. <laughs> but uh, prosopagnosis, people can't recognize faces, can tell whether a person's attractive or not. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? Is that clear? I have a question, Ken. Um, on that 
previous slide that you showed us with the streak of all the faces, those were what we had to choose from as far as attractiveness goes? No, that's the one that I that I just I, I just got a data. But I just I just well, you didn't do this test. I don't think that no was, no. But no. Was somebody asked to rate the most attractive of these. Yeah, the, what, you, what you do is you. I first started this. I had students do this. They just go to the dining halls or go to they go down the Harvard Square and they just go to a little, little cafe and they hey you want to do a quick test you know two minutes just arrange these faces most attractive guy on the right and most least attractive on the left uh -huh. vice versa. And then you can score them. It's actually quite interesting attractiveness. Um, then you could rate these faces. You can have another group of people rate these faces on how masculine they are. Huh. And, you, and you can do the same thing with female faces. And you can, and it's kind of one thing that's really clear. If you rate um, female faces on, you know, on sort of a, some kind of gender axis, which one looks more, less masculine, more masculine, and you get, you get ratings for each one of those pictures. And then you ask a separate group of people, well, which one's the attractive ones? I hate to tell you, the lines are perfect, like a correlation of 0.95. They just, just, just line up a straight line. Hmm. But you take males, zero. Whether you're masculine or feminine looking and male, nothing. I don't know, there must be some other basis for male attractive. But male attractiveness is quite, people are quite certain of their judgment. So it's kind of mysterious to me, at least. In other words, you're saying that females are more sure of what's attractive. No, no, males and females as subjects, it's just the faces themselves. A female face that people judge to be more feminine will be judged by most people as more attractive. Oh, but males can be anywhere. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not somebody's p published a paper on this and they have the answer, but I couldn't understand the paper. <laughs> well, well, one question. I noticed <laughs> in movies that, that the male stars don't have to be attractive, but mm -hmm. female stars have to be certain. Mm -hmm. Good looking, yeah. I have a little funny theory about evolution, but I don't think it's true, but is that because when when we um, Frank and I, this uh, grad student and I, we we did we got a hundred female faces too, and and we took it was funny we we took we would get, we would remove the hair you know like photographs stuff like that we and Frank and I just couldn't remember we couldn't recognize any of the females when they didn't have any hairstyles so we well our theory is that fem through some evolutionary process female faces are more alike and males have more ver variety I don't and then I've I've checked mm. I don't think that's true but. I, I haven't really checked this out. So anyway, that's that's one of the ideas. Any, I don't know. Question? Sorry, well, what? Um, had, has there been any determination of what part of the face people recognize? Um, I mean, I, I would have thought that I recognize people by their eyes, but now that we're wearing masks, and I lost a lot of my hearing. So I really look at people's mouths and they're gone behind their mask. And I, you know, people come up to me and I don't know who they are. <laughs> yeah, well, this is terrible. But maybe we should have little printed pictures of our face on our mask. <laughs> on the mask, yeah. <laughs> There are masks that have a plastic but thing But some people mouth. recognize each other by their hair or their eyes or their mouth or their ears or, does it, or is it the whole thing? There are special masks for people who are hard of hearing that have a plastic, clear plastic thing over the mouth so you can see their mouth. Yeah, and what about lip reading? I mean, so this is, this is so is it, there's no one part of the no, face? No, no, no. no eyes, eyes are very important. It's kind of interesting. People have done a lot of work on, um, a lot of work on, here's the following experiment. Let, you can, if you have, ask a bunch of people, show a bunch of people a bunch of faces, and record their eye movements. And, and what you'll do is that they'll, they'll land, each person has a, a very particular part, just kind of the bridge of the, between the top of the bridge of the nose and two eyes. There's a little, the, and it's, and it's the same. so one particular person puts their gaze on a particular part of the nose, another one, another part, but those on the midline. And then what this guy did at Santa Barbara, he, he, when he did was he made people look in their non-preferred position and their ability to recognize faces went down. So somehow we have a little procedure. We look at a particular part of the face, maybe one eye or the other, but usually between the two eyes at eye level. So I think you're okay. right about the eyes. What's really interesting, um, 
I've spent some time sculpting heads. And what's really important, I don't know, it's not the features, but it's the shape of the head that really determines what this, um, what this face is going to look like. Of course, we have to distinguish the features, but um, I don't know if you've done any work with the shape of the head, but that's no, sort that's of right. the guiding that's, principle in no, no, that's, that's, the heads. That's interesting. Who, who's, that, who's this speaking? Amy, Amy Gorman. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I know you. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, now, there's a lot of what, what you can do with this. There's a lot of work in computer graphics now, which you can do. You can take every head, just the shape of the head, and morph it into a standard head. And then you can, and then you can make it, you, know, you could caricaturize. You can even do character. That's how you can do caricatures of head shapes. And then you can do it. And you, you can take a, a head. And then you can wrap somebody else's texture on. You can take somebody's texture, meaning the, you know, the skin color and skin tone and stuff like that. Skin, you know, is very interesting because, you know, skin is, is one of the most interesting surfaces that you can think about because it's not, I mean, you look at a table, it just, you know, it's, it just reflects off the surface. But skin is, when they say it's only skin deep, that's, skin deep is pretty damn deep because the skin, <laughs> skin has many layers. Light comes in and it gets absorbed at different layers. So skin is not just a, a hard surface. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of a soft surface in terms of light. And to, to make skin is not that easy. Hair is the hardest thing to make in, in um, computer graphics. But oh, another thing here is that uh, you, most of, besides the feminine and masculine, the, the, many people have done things like they've more faces and maybe you've heard about this. What, what's a good looking face? And a good looking face is a face that's, if you take a bunch of faces and just morph them to make a, a sort of a single composite face, those are generally judged to be quite attractive. And even, I think they've even had babies look at those faces and babies kind of attract to those, I'm not sure. I think that's true. So attractive faces, I mean, I hate to tell you, some, there's some objective reason that some faces, objective is whatever that means, or I thought, uh, later on we could talk about later, but I've done studies with identical twins and to show that their that their pr pr preference for faces, one kind of face or another, is not under genetic control. We'll come back to that possibly. Oh, there's another. This is a weird test. You remember that guy, Sasha Baron Cohen? Mm -hmm. That guy. What's his from Uzbekistan? But well, this is his cousin or brother or something like that. He's a very famous psychologist in England. He's a little bit scary, but I mean, he's. I think he's pretty good. But he's. But he made this eyes test, and it's. A, it's I don't know. I don't know the answer to this one. Which which one is it? Roger, oh. is that your question? What What do you think? What do you think this? this you're supposed to. Uh, you look at this. These eyes, and you're supposed to tell: is it jealous, panic, arrogant, or hateful? But their yeah. eyes seem different. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you're, you're supposed to. This is that you're t being tested right now. And oh. um, anyway, I don't have the whole test here, but apparently, a postpagnosis do pretty well. I don't know the answer to this one. I I did pretty well on this test, but. I don't, I can't figure this one out, but well, oh, I, in, inversion, if you take these eyes and put them upside down, you can't do as well, but prosopagnos knows when they're right side, aren't that bad at this. They're not, they're better than people's inverted face. So emo emotion panic. recognition is not bad. I'd say panicked. I'd say, I'd say panicked. Panicked. Okay, well, I'll, I don't know. I'm <laughs> sorry, I don't know. So oh, I was I was struck by something in the article that suggested that that there's a learning curve too, and that babies learn to recognize the faces that they see most often. And so if they, which, which is why sometimes there are racial differences in in uh, I mean you 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 recognize faces that look like the faces that you were raised with, and so if you are Caucasian and you see a face of a black person, you're not as likely to recognize them as it. Can you speak to that at all? Well, yeah, that's that's called the other race effect. It's very well known. In fact, it's really um, the, the, the uh, test that we made that Brad and I made up, it, our test has now been made for Asians and somebody's making for black, they haven't done it, but there's a, a whole bunch of versions made in China. It has the exact same format as our test, but they're Chinese faces and Japanese faces and things like that. And then there, and there's a woman in Australia just thought our our faces were too varied in race. In Australia, at one time was much more homogeneous, and she didn't like our test, so she she made all white faces. I think we have a couple sort of vaguely non-white faces. So this is about this is about six or seven of these 
tests running around and some with synthetic faces. So, uh, so the other race effect is definitely the case. And, um, and, um, and I, I've had students from, from Asia, which struck me as odd, they can't recognize, um, if, well, yeah, you, you know that all Japanese look alike, we've heard that, but, uh, but uh, they, they, they thought all Americans look alike, so that's, that's the way uh -huh. it is. I had, in my lab, there were three Asian women about the same height, and one of my, my researchers says you could never tell them apart. Audrey okay. has a question. Sure. Audrey has a question. Yeah. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that, that beauty was um, the most average face. In other yeah, words, that's what I, that's what I said. If you take a bunch of faces and more, and that's not, not the whole story, but mm -hmm. if you take a bunch of faces and morph them, I could, sh I just couldn't get together. I, I've done a lot of morphing. I don't do it recently. You just take about, you take, you take, you take two faces and just morph them together. It's more attractive. And you take three, it's even more attractive, more up to about five or six, seven faces. It gets more and more attractive. You get rid of, it's not just symmetry. You, it's it's just you start getting some kind of ideal, this sort of mean form. Mm -hmm. and so that's just the way it is. But it's not the only. There's more mystery to it because in for female faces, it's the gender axis too that's important. It's average, but then because some guy took took you can do in computer graphics, you can take a a female form and just make it a little bit more even the best looking face and make it a tiny bit more feminine. It'll be even more beautiful. But if you do it even a bit more than that, then it looks kind of horrible. So this is just a little sweet spot. You can just make it face look a little bit better. This is a big deal in in uh, computer graphics. You know, they want to make they want to make movies you know, with you know you know artificial faces and stuff like that. That's it. Oh, yeah. And this and well, there's a really bad thing about faces right now. So um, I got very interested in face algorithms, and um, I would find out what you know different. Um, Researchers would have face record. You know, you know that the, in the marathon, the the the, the b marathon bomber was not identified by any computer algorithm. They weren't very good. It was it was people that saw the faces, but they're getting better and better now, and and now they're all, instead of being in the public domain, they're all proprietary. So we don't even know what they're doing. It's, it's a pretty awful field right now because, I mean, we, you're getting to the point that if you're in a on a college campus, there's a very small number of people on the college campus. You can get pictures of everybody. So if you see somebody, you can just take a picture of them or something like that and look at a database and you can find out who they are. So that, that's a kind of interesting, kind of creepy thing. Huh. Big I remember reading an article years ago about um, the, the, uh, some study that, that uh, showed um, faces to white children and face and the same faces to black children and ask them which one was the, the, the best or the prettiest or the most attractive. And, and both the white children and the black children chose the white face as opposed to the black face as being more attractive. Now, I, I'm, I'm wondering, is that just a sign of our culture? Uh, and I don't remember how old these kids were, or is there something innate about that? I don't, that... I don't think it's innate, but it's pretty, that, that's a pretty universal finding, except for very young kids, it's not there. It comes later, so I think that's an indication. And um, so I, I, did, I, I did an interesting study, with, I, it wasn't my idea, but um, um, this is kind of interesting. This is, a, this is kind of a subtle one. Um, um, it sort of comes out, do you, you know about stereotype threat? This, this, this is, this is a, a little bit of a aside, but we're, we still have time. I'm almost done anyway. Um, time. You know about if you, if you, what, what do you think of your identity? This is a this guy named um, this. This is kind of interesting. Say about blacks and um, I have a, I have a, I'll, I'll tell the whole story. But if you ask um, Asian women to write an essay about being Asian. And then another group of Asian women to write an essay about being um, a girl. Um, the ones that, I don't know how good these studies are, but then they give them a math test after that. <laughs> and then what happens is that the ones that wrote the essay about being a girl, they don't do as good as the one that wrote the essay about being an Asian. It's interesting. all about expectations, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so and, then, and so that, there's another one that, so I did a study, this is conceived not by me, this is an undergrad, 
and with and, and so she got her she did a senior thesis with me and it was a graduate help that was similar it was a little different they wrote essays about being black they, oh these are people that have are mixed these are kids who had um, you know one parent was black and one was white okay and they also wrote essays and then we had them look at faces and then whether they could pick faces out of a crowd a little bit better, you know, black or white or fat or brown. There was quite a difference. So I don't know, some, some, there's a little bit of, you know, this, it, this wasn't something I really was that interested in, but there, there was an effect there. Okay, we're going here. And, and this prosopagnosia kind of really the face specific deficit. It's kind of funny because I didn't really think about it too much, but I, I, um, there was a, for some reason, some guy in education at Ber I was living up at Harvard. Some guy contacted me. Um, he wanted to be tested, and he he was a Berkeley professor in education. So, because he 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 had some problems with faces, he thought, but he wasn't really sure. He, he just thought that the whole thing was ridiculous. So, but he somehow he just got curious. Although, and there's a guy named there's a guy named Hubert Dreyfus, a very famous philosophy professor at 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 Berkeley said he was prosopagnosic and that he should, um, that if people, if people um, wanted to talk to him, they should just mention their name. Hey, I'm George so-and-so. Hi, how are you doing? Cause stuff like that. And then they should do that with him. And so then he started interesting. And then, so I tested this guy, but I also gave him this test here, which was showing things that don't have anything to do with anything. Does that you show like 50 paintings? And then later on show, you know, this and it's a bit an old new test. Have you seen this one before? Mm. It turns out that a lot of the people with pros are diagnosed. I'll show the data, I guess I'll show it right away. Um, was, they, they weren't doing too well. So here's the results. So on the on the horizontal axis is our normal people. So there's a y and minus one is a st one standard deviation, too. So there's a normal range in terms of uh, face memory. And then there's a normal range in terms, these are sort of, these are normalized to zero. So zero, zero is the mean. Now, these, these red people are prosopagnosics. These are, and they're all shifted because I've only chosen ones that are bad. They're almost two standards. So they're at about the, I mean, you might say the, th the fifth percent or the third percentile. They're really bad. I mean, they're, you know, and mm -hmm. percentile wise, they'd be really bad. So, but if the, if they if they're, if they were just pure prosopagnosic, they shouldn't, they should be vertically on this line here. They should just be shifted. But you can see that some of them are shifted. A lot of them, they're not as shifted as much, but they're, you know, they're, they're about halfway down. So they're not doing too well on that test as well. So that's, so there's a visual memory problem here. Or, I gotta... That test was to, um, was to see if they could uh, correctly identify the art pieces that you, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they, that was a that's that's a problem there. So that 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 makes you think. And then, so we and I didn't have a chance to tell you all these different tests we did. This is one a graduate student I had from India. And then this test I haven't even mentioned, but that all the vision tests they were bad. All these vision tests, but oh, there was a there was a kind of verbal memory. Uh, it's quite a very difficult test. They were pretty good there, and. Face gender, telling the gender of a face and the age of a face, they're very, they weren't, they weren't bad. So that's really weird. So these two really are, show that they're, they have face processing, they're normal. Episode, they don't have a, they're not screwed up in memory, but they, something to do with visual memory. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm saying that this is something that I, you know, the, the problem with me as a scientist, I get bored. Okay, <laughs> I don't get the answer. And so I told my all of my students to go, go do face. You guys keep going. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. <laughs> but I came up with some conclusions. It, it, it's not face blindness. It's maybe bad visual memory, not bad memory in general. And and one of the interesting things about let's say you have a bad visual memory, and what, the reason why you think face memory is is bad because that's one of the most important things you you have to do in your life. I mean, if you can't remember abstract art, who gives a damn? You know? I mean, if you, if you can't remember horses or all kinds of stuff or get lost or something like that, but if you don't recognize faces, it has consequences. And that's what you pick up on. So 
So another alternative view, I'm giving all the stuff about faces being special and stuff like that, that this developmental prosopagnosia might be the wrong label. It could be just you have bad visual memory, but what a salient thing of your, the problem you have in life is that this is one in our modern age. Let's say you're a farmer, you know, never interact with a lot of people, you never even know. And I, I don't think prosopagnosia probably over history was that much of a problem because there's so many, I mean, we meet so many darn people these days. I and mean, if you're a farmer, first of all, you, people didn't have a lot of clothes. You can recognize their clothes. A lot of people missed missing their teeth. So they had all kinds of uh, skin problems and um, they, didn't, they didn't take showers, stuff like that. So there's so many ways to recognize people that, I don't know, face recognition wasn't that important, but right now in this day and age, it's quite important. Mm. So what I think is we had this gender thing I think it's a question of practice. Let's say every time you meet a person who's a male and every time you meet a female, you said, oh, that's male and female. But if you meet John Doe, you don't have many examples. Of it. In other words, you have plenty of practice. So even though you're not great at face, uh, doing things like you might have bad visual memory, all your life you had practice on gender, practice on emotion and beauty and age, but you don't have a lot of practice if you just saw a person three or four times, you're not, mm -hmm. so you, you're, so I think it's kind of a tip of the iceberg. I mean, just one of these extreme, it's just, you just, you just, you just the roll of the dice that so you weren't had a very good measure of memory. It doesn't really matter that much, but in our day and age, it matters. I think that's, that's my new way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. A couple odds and ends here. Um, I got a grant to do this, and I just love these prosopagnosic people. They're such, they're such fun people. So I set up a clinical trial because this guy that wanted to do it. So we tested, we had, we, I think we, we had marginal effect. But the guy that worked with me really thought it was good, but I didn't think these people were helped very much. Inherited, that's interesting. That's, that's, that's a, here's something here that some of you people have studied psychology, but the classic twin studies, you heard of twin studies, you compared. You, can't, you compare monozygotic versus dizygotic twins, and you put this into model. You see, monozygotic twins, the correlation between twin one, this is twin one and this is twin two, is about 0.7, and dizygotic is 0.3. Mm -hmm. And if you put these into these various models, that indicates that just like 100%, and these are normal people. So this is the Australian twin registry, 164 pairs. This is, these are very hard studies to do in the past, but we have on the internet, you can do this. The people that are hardest to find are dizygotic. Dizygotic twins don't really care about being dizygotic. They're not really signing up, but we got, we did it. So that's another thing. And we've done some other studies like that. Oh yeah, well, this runs in families too. Here's a, some of you guys have, any biologists here? All these black things mean that, I think black square means boy and that girl. Mm -hmm. And, yes. Um, yes. This, this is a family we studied, and there's another. And then, this, oh, with these people, this is a. Brad went to a. Somebody got married in Wyoming. <laughs> they all showed up in Wyoming for this three-day wedding. So he went. He, he went and tested everybody of this damn wedding. <laughs> so much. That was so <laughs> much. And then this is another family. I spent a lot of time with this family. Is this is kind of interesting because. There's three different lines here that this could be, you know, this looks like autosomal dominant, reasonable penetrance. Looks somewhat like classic, a classic case here, but uh, this this got screwed up. I, I even, um, it took me years, to, <laughs> it took me it took years to do this. And even, uh, I even got a company in Beijing called Beijing Genomics to, we got the DNA of all, all these people but I can't for the life of me get it out of them now. And um, and because they, they, they did it for free. I mean, this, this was a cost, this would have cost us a couple hundred thousand dollars and then they sort of disappeared. So I don't know, it's really kind of sad because I don't know, and if you studied genetics, I mean, see the, the, these three, they're likely to have, I don't know, it's hard to say. I'm not really an expert in this. I'm, there's some kind of crap with the data and stuff like that. That's not, you know, it's hard to say, but this was sort of suggestive and, um, but we really weren't able to do it. Here's our, here's my claim to fame being a friend of Oliver Sacks. I have to tell you a funny story about Oliver Sacks. I knew Oliver Sacks when he was very young. He was a, he was a head of BMW Motors. He was a neurologist at UCLA. And um, he doesn't remember this, but I knew him a little bit. I gave him his first marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, if you ever read his biography, he doesn't remember me, but he he had a terrible trouble with drugs. It was terrible. Mm. 
It's an interesting bi moving one. It's an interesting biography. Okay. Um, mm. question. I, have, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I didn't get to hear from Susan or Alice about their personal experiences, and I wonder if they'd be willing to speak. Yeah, it's, 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 it's Susan. Susan Flowers. Mm. Susan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, unmute my screen here, unshare my screen, and just go like this. Here we are. I know where Susan. Here's Susan right here. Hi there. I put her on the spot, but she said you're willing to say a few no things. No worries. And, and, sure. And you can pepper her with a couple questions because she's got some problems. Did, did, did some, some, some of the things I said uh, ring true for you? Absolutely. And one thing I wanted to say, you, you had mentioned that um, faces are ineffable. And I find that I can sometimes recognize a face if I can describe it in words. So, for example, I noticed on one of the, the tests that um, one of the subjects had a pointed chin. Right. That was easy, to, easy for me to, uh, to pick out. Uh, if a person has a high forehead, uh, for example, if a person has particularly big uh, wide eyes, um, as long as I can verbalize it, I may be able to to actually identify them. I noticed this one time w regarding a cat. Um, a friend had two cats that were similar in color. And it took me a long time to figure out how to tell these cats apart. And I noticed one day that, oh, one of the cats had a white spot on the top of its head. Okay, after that, I never had trouble picking out, you know, uh, discerning which cat was which. So the same with people. Um, so there's some features, there's kind of funny stories that one guy came, he's really terrible, Prozac knows it, but it wasn't his wife, it was a business partner, and they would spend a lot of time together. And he, 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 one thing he'd do, he'd, when they meet somebody, he'd always introduce, you know, the, he'd tell his friend, uh, this is Joe or something like that. But one, the interesting thing about this guy, he was an avid bird watcher. But he was pretty good at it because he could see that each bird has a little tiny little feature that he could focus on. Kind of mm -hmm. like you're talking about pieces. Go, go mm -hmm. on. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's the same idea. And so, how do you de how do you deal with people? I notice you have a strategy. How do you de how you deal with? Them? I do. I try to get them to talk to me, <laughs> um, or it and get some context. Get some, some, con some context. Oh, I'm just. Oh, getting I'm just getting. Are you hearing, Are that, you hearing echo? that echo? Mm -hmm. uh, you have an earphone on your phone? An earphone on yeah, my with phone. The, yeah, with the oh, problem, maybe if I you, you get that, that microphone and your computer microphone are sort of interacting in some kind of way. Just use, I think that's the trouble. I you know, <laughs> can't hear you. Can't hear you now. Oh, is that better? <laughs> yes. Yes. A little better? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, okay. You want to just use oh more. yes, my strategies. So I try to get them to talk to me, um, and then I figure out who they are. But just in case it's somebody uh, I'm introduced to somebody new or whatever, I've learned to never say when I'm leaving, uh, "It's nice. It was nice meeting you." I always say, "It's nice to see you," and that <laughs> way it covers it covers everything because I. Chances are, I won't know that I even know the person. Not, mm -hmm. it isn't that I don't recognize them. It's I don't recognize that I've ever seen them before. Mm -hmm. So it happened once. Uh, I I remember the last time I said it's nice meeting you. Uh, I was at university and I was introduced to um, a friend's roommate, and. Um, when so, so his roommate and I had been chatting and then when we got ready to go I turned to the roommate and I said well, it was nice meeting you and I'll never forget what he said I I can say it verbatim he said when I said it's nice meeting you he said you're joking right I'm mm. in your circuits class mm. I sit right next to you <laughs> you talk to me sometimes <laughs> so after that it's always it's nice to see you uh -huh. Susan, what's it like when you look in the mirror? Do you recognize yourself? Well, I don't know if I would, if I didn't know I was standing there. But it's kind of hard, you know, when you're standing and, and you move your head and it's like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, 
yeah, so that's that's all I know about that. So that's what about if you saw a photo of yourself and another person? Would you be able to figure out who's Sometimes. Who? Sometimes huh? I can because usually, but usually I already know these pictures. So mm -hmm. I know that that's me. So I don't. So when, I, did, I think when, did you, when did you know that you had a problem? How old were you? Well, I've known it pretty since I was a kid. However, I didn't know that I, it was unusual. I knew that I couldn't recognize strangers, but I grew up in a small town. I went to the school, school 12 grades with the same people. So I didn't, that wasn't a problem. But if ever I saw a stranger um, and I, I would see them again, I wouldn't be able to recognize them. And I knew that, but I thought it was a personal problem, which it is a personal problem, but I thought I just wasn't paying attention. So I spent a lot of time really staring at faces trying to pay attention and I never got it. Mm. Yeah, what yeah. about names? Did you, do you have trouble putting a name to a face? Um, if I can recognize the face, I'm pretty darn good at names. Well, that's the opposite of how I am. Yes, my no, husband uh, says, oh, I, I never forget a face, but I, I always, but I forget names and I'm just the opposite. So we, yeah. we're a good pair. <laughs> <laughs> how do you describe your learning style? My uh, learning style? Yeah, for instance, uh, if you don't recognize faces well, you know how there's different, you know, some people are visual learners, some people are more uh, kinetic learners. Uh, is, do you find this is something that's across the board for you? Can you absorb information well from reading? Is there, you know, is, would you describe it specifically uh, as a problem with a facial recognition, but not a problem in any other sort of learning areas of life? Um, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know. I would say I'm an, uh, I'm a kinesthetic learner. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have, I do have a real problem in, in, uh, meetings. Probably a lot of you do, um, especially if you're not, not interested in what's going on. I can just, w at university, especially history, God, I hate history. And it's just a bunch of stories. And, um, I, I would just sleep through all the all the lectures. I couldn't do that, but I think I don't think that has anything to do with with my face facial recognition problem. So Suzanne, mm -hmm. uh, quite a few people who have um, face problems have something called topographagnosia, which is a big word, but they get lost. Is that? Oh, my husband could tell you stories, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I do. I, I do and and some well then I've lived in in different countries um, and so I think maybe my um, uh, my experiences kind of contribute to that because sometimes I will have a, a moment when I think oh what country am I in now <laughs> um, but I don't think that's what you're talking about either no no that's but that's it. So, so you do you did you know that when you like you're in grade school? But you were you went to a small no. school. But, but, yeah, but so there's quite a few pr pr but thought that everybody was just like them. That's exactly you know, that's so, that's what I thought. Yeah, there's a head, one of the earliest people I met was kind of an interesting person. She was I got a lot of information from her. Heather, what's her last name now? She's a novelist, and she's a she's a professor in an, an English department. And there's there's about four men in her department. She can't tell them apart, and. Mm -hmm. But she goes on book tours. She loves book tours because you don't have to recognize anybody. You know? That's right. Oh, you know what I really loved when I was single? Speed dating. Oh, okay. It was marvelous. <laughs> Five minutes. Uh, yeah, I love that. So what like tricks have you used to recognize your husband? <laughs> I was wondering. Well, I buy his clothes. My husband is Korean, and there are not many Koreans in this town. Okay. Yeah. So that makes it easy. Oh, so you can recognize race then? Oh, yeah. Um, pretty, uh, most of the time I, I can, but a lot of the times I'm just, I think I'm just not paying attention. If you were to say to me, um, you know, what, 
what race do you think this person is? I can probably tell you. Although several times my husband has said, well, you did notice that that person was Asian, right? And I go, well, no. <laughs> but I do think if I paid attention, I would have been able to. Since you buy his clothes, aren't you getting an extra cue? Because you might recognize the clothes. That exactly. Right. <laughs> it's exactly. unlikely anybody else would be wearing them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, I, I recognize people by their hair, which you guys have talked about before, by their gait, the style of clothes they wear, their their voice there's so many uh, i can i can recognize a person faster if they have their back to me um if they're walking away from me i can probably recognize them if they're walking toward me i know who they are <laughs> wow. but you were at you're talking about what what is your focal point mine is exclusively the mouth i i would that, never that, recognize that, that, that's eyes the that's the problem with prospect nose they go they go to the mouth really uh, yeah that that's that, 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 that which because somehow you can't really, you, you don't have the, um, the somehow they don't have the apparatus because that's the, the eyes are the most important. And for some reason, uh, that, that's, this is, this is quite, not really mm. well known, but there's mm. quite a bit of anecdotes. Mm. I have tried to focus on eyes just to see if I could do it and I couldn't. It just, yeah. it, it it, they, they don't, they, they don't resonate with me. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, there's, there's so many, we had some other funny stories. We had a woman, two, there's two funny stories. One was, um, I, we all of a sudden I was in on the national team. I, I went on Diane Sawyer's program. I, I don't watch TV, so I don't know these names. But anyway, but then I was on all kinds of TV shows. I never been on TV shows before, but that was a couple of years. And then somebody writes to me. She's seventy five years old. Says now I know the story of my life because she didn't know she was frozen back. Does it? Everything fit together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She finally had a story. But then there's another woman that drove all the way from Toronto to Boston and she wanted to be tested because she thought that prosopagnosia was the explanation of her whole, all of her trials and tri tribulations of life. <laughs> we, she was very disappointed. We tested her. She was perfectly okay with faces. She was very disappointed. Huh. <laughs> I did have one, one kind of funny story. Not long ago, my, um, my boss who lives, lived in a different uh, state and he was visiting the the facility that I was in, the location, but I didn't know he was going to be there. So he wasn't um, one of the people I was expecting to see. And in the cafeteria, he, he was there and he shouted at me, Suzanne, and waved like he wanted me to come over and talk to him. And so I did, and I did my, my usual shtick. I walked over and said, hi waiting for him to say more and he wouldn't say anything. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm standing there and it's awkward now. And I was, I was pretty close to him physically and realized that he was wearing a name tag. We all had to wear name tags at this company and he was wearing it down on his belt. And I thought, <laughs> I'm going to have to look at his name tag, but it's going to be <laughs> so obvious. <laughs> and so I just, Stood hoping that he was going to say something. He never said a word. Uh, Finally, I did look down at his at his name tag, and I said, "Bill," and he said, "You didn't recognize me," and <laughs> I I just kind of blew it off. But I went back to my office, and I thought he's going to think I'm senile, and that's not a good thing. So I sent. I quickly decided what I needed to do. I I fired off an email to him. And I said, you just had a close encounter with prosopagnosia. If you don't know what that is, would you please Google it? <laughs> <laughs> so right, right now, the best cure for prosopagnosia is public awareness or some kind of awareness of your friends and stuff like that. And, yeah. and, and if your friends know about it, they'll help you. That, there's no, I mean, we can, I mean, brain diseases right now are just too hard to deal with. And I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I bet that's a good, I'm glad you were up to come, Suzanne. It's really great that you were here. Really so, My uh, pleasure. Any other questions more generally about this kind of stuff? Ken, Ken could I say something about uh, bird watching? Yeah. Um, I wanted to, because, um, you know, Audrey and I do a lot of bird watching in other countries. And naturally, the reason you do it is because you want to see birds that you would never see at home. And so uh, I'm always struck by um, the limitations of uh, doing it that way because, well, just for an example, yesterday we were walking up in the 
Berkeley Hills up in uh, Tilden Park. And we heard a little rustling in the, in, the, in the undergrowth. And we know exactly what bird that is because there's, there's this one bird called a spotted toad. Spotted, spotted toad, spotted toad, spotted toad. Oh, oh. Where, <laughs> where's that echo coming from? I don't know. Wow, that was impressive. Yeah. So, but if you're in another, so we, you know, we'd actually got a very, you don't get very good looks at this bird, but I did actually see it, but just to confirm, but if you're in another country, you don't have any of those cues because you don't know the habits or the, the song or the behavior or the sociality or are you going to see one by himself? Or are you going to see a group together? All these little things that help you to identify uh, what species it is among known birds is, is so different. And so I guess what I'm aiming at here is I think the species, our species, uh, really privileges vision. Um, and that, you know, we, we certainly downplay smell, you know, we don't basically don't like smell very much. And um, hearing, you know, people are various, have some deficits or they, I mean, hearing is a little bit less reliable. Um, so vision, you know, we're a very, very visual species, but but you know, there's more to vision than just what it looks like. If you if you uh, are are preparing to go bird watching in another country, like Sri Lanka, which we went to recently, you get the book about the birds of Sri Lanka, and you look at them and you go, okay, it's a blue bird with black spots or whatever, and you know that's all you know about it. You know, you I mean, you might read a little bit more, but basically you just have this very static. A visual representation of the bird, whereas the the whole the the bird or the person that you're trying to recognize has so much more going for them. Or that you know, and I I I hear what Suzanne's saying about she's waiting for this person to say something or to do something or to give some more cues. You know, because we all need cues in life. You know, and just the straight static visual is is so limited and it just strikes me that we put so much attention on that you know but i just think it's a limitation of our species that we're that you know maybe it has to do with this thing you were talking about well, we're, we're so wrapped up in our lives i mean um i a couple of years ago what's the name of that book sapiens have you, any people read that yeah book? i read it yeah uh -huh. so he's saying that pre pre-agricultural uh, pre people knew everything about their world. I'm walking around Berkeley and there's all these different kinds of trees. Of course, they're from all over the world, South American stuff, but I don't know them. But he claims that when you were, if you were before, if you're a hunter gatherer, you probably knew every damn plant and everything. Yeah, well, you might even know like, them as individuals. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of neat. I, I, I wish I, now that we're locked down, I sort of feel I'd like to be, have that kind of sense about things. I'm, I was hoping that um, all the plants here in El Cerrito, I just love to be able to sort of feel more familiar with them, but it's, I don't see any way to do that. Is there any? That, Can I, mean, I have an idea for you? Um, mm -hmm. There's this there's this app that you can get. It's called PlantNet. I think I tried one of them. It was made too many mistakes. We'll try it again. PlantNet. Okay. Plant, you put PlantNet it like, will give you um, some choices. You know, you take a picture, and yeah. then it'll give you choices of plants that look like that. If the, the, the first three plants I tried, it was three for three, and then the next three was it struck out. So I could try some more. <laughs> okay. I could try that, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you strike out. That's happened to me too. It's pretty neat, all right. But, well, um, well, thank you, Susan, for sharing that with us. Yeah. I have one question or comment. Yes. Um, I, as we've been talking today, I've been realizing that the one's face is the one part of our bodies that we can't see um hmm. straight on right I, I mean maybe the back back of our back but you know you and so it's also a part of our body that's extremely expressive i mean the eyes are the windows of the soul and yet we can't see hmm. our face unless we're on zoom um as we are re as we're interacting with another person and i i just i, I mean i just think that's Odd. And I wonder if that has anything to do with what we're talking about today. Well, I, I don't know, but there, there, there's a theory, um, it's a James Lang of theory of motions that 
that your musk, your feeling, your emotions. I don't know if this is true or not, but your bodily state. Let's say, what they say, if they put a pencil between your um, teeth, you, you, you are more likely to be happy <laughs> because you're smiling. I don't know. You've heard of that, haven't you? I've heard of that, yeah. <laughs> and so I don't know if that's true or not. And, um, and so there's, well, we, but you know, primates have facial muscular, but most of them, I mean, cats don't have facial expressions, particularly. I mean, they're probably some, but they don't as many know. Primates have so many, the number of muscles we have is amazing in the face. And so that, I mean, I think the communication by the face is just probably uh, one of the most important communicating, I mean, body language and faces. Ken, um, isn't there something about motor, uh, sorry, mirror neurons? Mirror and, neurons, yeah, I'm writing a paper on this. Oh yeah? I don't think it's it's I, I, I think that that's something else. that's a, that's the thing with, what Herson did was these, these very brilliant physiologists in in, um, in Italy a guy named Rizzolotti he's a very very skilled person he he had put electrodes uh, single unit electrodes in the motor areas of monkeys and then before the monkey did something let's say the monkey's reaching for something and grabbing it he, he could grab it with a power grip or precision grip and then he sh then there's somebody in the lab that made their arm a precision grip or a power grip and there were some neurons that responded both to seeing uh, somebody do that action and also make uh, make that action themselves in other words so the motor the motor action and the watching the action the same neuron fired so they said they weren't in the, so this got I mean, I, one of my colleagues is named V.S. Ramachandran. He's, I know him very well. He thinks that those neurons are the basis of civilization. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I got the idea that we we learn how to do stuff by imitating. Well, I, 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 I'm pretty skeptical. There's all different kinds of neurons. I think those weren't, there's, there's no doubt that those neurons exist, but there's many other neurons that exist as well. There's so many neurons in that. But the whole motor area, if you look, if you record from the motor cortex, there are tons of neurons that are visual neurons, and it, this is very mysterious. And it's been known for years, and so if you, um, in fact, even those motor neurons that project to the spinal cord, sometimes, I mean, they won't be mirror neurons. In other words, the, there's so many um, neuron uh, responses to motor neurons that shouldn't be. I mean, it's. The brain is much more complicated than any of us really thought of. It's so interconnected, and and so th this is really a, a right now. This is one of the crises in motor physiology. People just don't, people don't really. I don't think they have any idea what's going on here. The, the, the conceptual basis of it is is really quite. I mean, I'm just been, I'm, I'm I'm writing a review article. I'm an outsider. Okay, I'm just trying to survey. I'm in retirement, so and do this. But so, but I'm reading all these papers, and so with with some colleagues, and so. Um, and I talked to somebody at length this morning about it. So I don't. I just don't think people understand. I think that there, social psychologists got interested in this. I mean, the trouble with scientists, they get so there's so many crises of not understanding. And then somebody discovers something and they grab onto it. Now this is the this is the answer. And um, you know, it's been sort of the answer for about 20 years, and it's kind of it's sort of washing away now. I think it's probably it's 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 sort of not as popular anymore. But you know, there's somebody there's so many conundrums in science and some people say, ah, oh, that's the answer. Um, I guess it's not, but you know, I, I, in the beginning, I didn't doubt their observation. I think they're absolutely true, but there's so many other observations that aren't like that. This is just one of many, it's, but it's something that's very tantalizing, but they're just cherry picking out of all different combinations. And that's kind of, that's not, they can't make, you can't make a story out of that. I mean, the study of the brain is, is like any field of science. It's, it's still pretty murky and unknown. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to endorse that one. I'm, I'm trying to figure, but I'm figuring out how to write that part, but I don't really know. But I'm a real, I'm a, I'm not a bird watcher, but I, I've just put up, when we're all stuck here, I, I, I bought a bunch of bird, bird feeders and I'm enjoying it. I've got, I've got house finches, the red ones. I've got <laughs> goldfinches, the yellow ones. I got the scrub, do you, you know about scrub jays, about the, them being some of the most intelligent birds around? Well, really, more than crows. Well, well no, in fact, the scrub jay, it is mentalized. And scrub jays, there's this woman named Nikki Clayton. She's a professor at University of Cambridge now. And she's sort of the person on um, animals, even having something called episodic memory, where they can actually, I don't, I don't know, the, you should read this woman, Nikki Clayton, scrub jays. I think scrub jays have been studied the most, not just for doing a trick like 
uh, sticking a, a, a hook and stuff like that. But in terms of mental time travel, I don't really understand all the studies, but they're very, very clever. And they're very aware of what other, they're hiding food when they know other animals are around when they're not around. I mean, crows have done this, but I think I'm guessing the scrub jays that we see in Berkeley, that, that's the jay we have here, is probably, I'm not saying it's the smartest bird, but I think it's the bird that's been studied the most in, in great detail by this woman named Nikki Kling. Might be interesting to look into that. I, I'd like to sort of... What's they're, all, they're all in the corvid family, you know. They're all in the corvid family. Yeah. And, and it's just that these have been studied the most. She was at Davis for a while. And I mean, we have the... We have the scrub jay here, and, and some people have stellars. I haven't seen stellars in Berkeley. Yeah. We have them up in the hills. Yeah. You can find yeah. the hills. What is Nikki's last name? Clayton. Thank you. Yeah, she, that, for some reason, she doesn't do, she doesn't just quit. But all her students, but she has wonderful, she, she's now a ballerina. For some reason, <laughs> in her 50s, she doesn't want to be a scientist anymore, and she's dancing. <laughs> So I don't know what to say, but her work is, you can work on Wikipedia. Or if you send me something, I'll, I'll try to find something. I, 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 I read a lot about it, but I'm, I'm a kind of slow reader and sometimes I can't understand the details of the experiment. I'd like, but I, I'm, I'm guessing I've been, I just talked, some of you know that I know Irene Pepperberg and I just chatted with Irene Pepperberg because mm -hmm. she, she's another, she studies parrots and she told me that she thinks that Nikki's the real thing. All the stuff she does is very good. So, mm -hmm. but I, 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 I I'm not sure until, but anyways, they, they, they can remember things like they, they make them hide worms that are, um, that apparently if you give them a worm and the, the bird doesn't like that, after three days you eat the worm, it tastes terrible. But if you hide a peanut, and so, so they'll, they'll store these, they store these, all these different things, but they'll remember to find the, after three or four days, they won't be looking for the worm, they'll be looking mm -hmm. for the peanut. She got all kinds of experiments like that. So mm -hmm. I can't, I wouldn't be able to keep track of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah we well, know that, 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 that there is a, there's a, a structure in the brain called hippocampus and during a certain time of the year when animals are storing food, that part of the brain gets to be larger. That was done by some guy in England. So this is a lot of caching and stuff like that. That's, really that cool. interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. And that's the, the memory center in your brain, the hippocampus. Yeah, it's one. Of the, it's one of the areas that's sort of meant to be very extremely important for memory. Right. right yeah. And then in another season, it won't be so big. Right. Right. And, and that's what I read. I mean, I'm. I'm just keep. I, I just sort of keep tabs on this. I. I don't know how well they've done the studies and stuff like that, but I'm. I'm guessing they're probably okay. And I mean, I think I'm. I think I'm, I, I come from the field of neurophysiology, but I think animal behavior is is the most underfunded area of science to me. It's really. It's quite important. I'm, I'm just sort of disappointed that America doesn't fund this kind of stuff. Europe, Europe, Europeans are doing it much more than Americans. Mm. I, I just think that, that just the oh, just natural behavior of animals. I mean, there's bird watches, but uh, Roger's different than most. I went to Trinidad once. Have, have you been to that um, bird station in Trinidad? Yeah. What's it called? Um, is there Ace or something? Ace, 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 Ace or right. Right. Ace Ace right. right. Yeah. That's supposed to be one of the most uh, rich. Is that? It's got a lot of birds there. It's and fabulous, it's fabulous. But there are people traveling all over the world. They just want. They have this checklist. They want to check that they've seen this or that bird, and and so. Yeah. But they don't really care about the uh, the animals. So when I went to Trinidad, the bird that I really liked, or you ever heard of Oropendia? You know that bird. Oropendia. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's it, you see them in the city parks, you know, but. It's, it, it's, it's not a corvid, but it's an incredible, you've seen that bird. It's just an incredible oh, sure. bird. Yeah, it's beautiful. And there's it, there's it's a, a beautiful lot of bird. Them. And nobody's in the Oropendia because it's in the city park. But yeah. that, they make these huge nests like this and they, you've heard them sing and stuff like that. I mean, there's such an incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Voice. yeah. yeah there, there's a, a lot of different uh, species. Who's that? Hi, okay. Judas. It's Al again. Uh, we got to meet him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we yeah. have the second friend's point about what gets funded and what doesn't. Uh, I too happen to be retired from Harvard, but uh, really, I had a somebody I met bird watching in undergrad who wound up having to do his senior thesis in anthropology, which was my field because nobody in organismal and evolutionary biology was interested at the time, it's not true now, in 
uh, a thesis on birds in Uganda, the you know the, there were there wasn't anybody doing whole organisms at least for avians, and I had a colleague, in fact, the librarian at the MCZ library who was an undergrad at UMass Boston had to do her degree in anthropology because the biology department was not interested in whole organism studies. Oh. Wow. <laughs> well, some, I know the I know the people I know the people that we be there's some probably this probably changed a bit. So, so. Yeah. Well they're sure got a top notch ornithologist now at the MCZ, so yes. Uh, yeah, I mean it's just it's really um I mean, I mean, birds are probably the only animals that we really see. Hmm. I mean, yeah. most that most mammals they're they're nocturnal, aren't they? They're hidden. I mean, squirrels. Well, you know, our our experience when Audrey and I uh, went to East Africa back in the in the nineteen eighties, sometime, and at that time we weren't bird watchers, but we went with a friend who who was, and we were very impatient with him. We kept saying. Ron, come on, we got to go see the giraffes and the rhinos and the, you know, the cheetahs and all that. And he said, oh, relax, you're going to see them. He said, but check out these birds, you know, they're fantastic. And so, you know, we, we, uh, we started noticing and we said, well, you know what, you're always going to see birds. I mean, you can be anywhere in the world, you're going to see birds. And, um, and, and if you go someplace different, even the most common bird, like you were saying about the oropendulas, the most common bird is in the city park. You know, the locals think, ah, what's a big deal? But for you as a foreigner, you go in there, wow, you know, this is fabulous, you know. But, you know, the, so the birds, so we got really interested in birds because the fact is that there's, there's the mammals, most mammals are what they call crepuscular or nocturnal. I mean, there are diurnal mammals, but, you know, they're not very many different ones. And I'm not saying there's nothing interesting about them, but birds is, and they're colorful. And well, we're going to give a little talk on Friday about Sri Lanka birds. So I hope some people can come. Okay, okay, but, good. Uh, <laughs> it's just- It's not like I, I had to bring this out because I didn't, I never get to. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, I, and I wanted to show it off because I made this. Oh, nice. <laughs> Can you see it? Or is it, or is it upside, or is it reversed? It's good. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> this was my March for Science sign, and I never get to pull it out. This seemed like the perfect time. Well done. Well done. <laughs> oh, <that's great>. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, yeah. there was a lot of, there happened to be a number of ornithologists in those March for Science in Portland, and so that was. That was a popular sign. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that's great. You know, that word cloaca comes from Latin and it, it referred to the uh, main sewer of Rome. You know, Rome. <laughs> to have a, to have a, a <laughs> to have a big city, you have to have some sewer system, right? So Rome, of course, they just dumped it in the Tiber River, but this great cloaca, the cloaca major was the, uh, the, the main sewer system of Rome. So the birds have inherited the good name there. I'll never, I'll never, uh, I'll have that association for the rest of my life. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, birds don't have, they don't have separate uh, for urine and um, no. solid. It's the same, it's the same, it's a, it's a, a kind of a combo, right? Is that what, mm -hmm. what lands on your windshield? Is, uh... <laughs> Why is, white? To... Why is it white? Why is it white? Because RP well, is white. Uh, I don't know. They, they, uh, uh, there are people who actually study that. You know, I mean, there's the, the bird. The birds. <laughs> I can see birds mating, but do they have penises? Um, yes, they do. They, do some birds have penises? Well, Alan? it's not called a penis. It's called something else. But but they have an organ. The males mm -hmm. have an organ, and they in, insert it in the female's organ. Okay. I never seen pictures of that. I got to go look this up. It's very hard to see. It happens so fast, you know, and you wonder how does, how does he get past her tail? But she manages to s swing her tail around, you know, and he does the deed. <laughs> I used to raise chickens and we saw that all the time. Oh yeah. <laughs> see? Roosters. 
Well, Ashby Village talking about the birds and the bees. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, it seems like it seemed all this elaborate sexual selection and the sex act is like that, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. When you look at all the energy that goes into uh, wooing the female, you know, the dancing and the singing and the showing off and the strutting. I guess that's the most important part. That <laughs> yeah, well, it works. <laughs> if, if it works, it gets uh, reinforced and passed on. So, right. yeah. So, Audrey, what's up well, next? Thank you. I want to thank you, Ken. This has been wonderful. And I really like it that we've all been able to participate and um, discuss and so on because I think we need to, we, that's, that's part of the fun for us. And thank you, Ken, for encouraging that and being patient with us and so on. And thank you for Suzanne and Alice for coming. Our special Thanks guest. for having us. You're welcome. Yeah, I enjoyed it.